We are living in a computer programmed reality and the only clue we have to it is when some variable is changed and some alteration in our reality occurs. We would have the overwhelming impression that we were reliving the present deja vu, perhaps in precisely the same way, hearing the same words, saying the same words. I submit that these impressions are valid and significant. And I will even say this, such an impression is a clue that at some past time point, a variable was changed, reprogrammed as it were, and that because of this, an alternative world branched off. Welcome to the Monday Mashup. I'm Robert Phoenix. I'm your host. Greetings. Greetings to the chat room. Erica, Janet, good morning. Uh, it is the uh, 6th of February, the uh, Monday after the probably the second most popular day in the history, in the history, the second most popular day in the current cultural milieu of this country, the Super Bowl, might even might even surpass Christmas at this point. Um, but let's just for the uh, sake of hierarchy, let's rank it number two. Let's just put it in there number two. And um, I watched the game. I did not watch a lot of the ramp up to the game. I stayed away from the hype. And I uh, managed to fill my time doing other things, which is which is good. I mean, I, I, when I was a kid, I used to plant myself in front of the TV from the very first moment the coverage would start. And I wouldn't move. Well, I'd move every now and then, but you know what I mean. I was there till game time. And uh, yesterday was different. I managed to turn the TV on literally right at kickoff. So I missed a lot of the pregame banter, and um, I saw it uh, over at the confines of my mother's place uh, with my kid, and it was cool, you know, very, very, uh, I don't know, low-key experience. So, you know, when I look at stuff like that, I'm looking at commercials, uh, and I'm looking at, I'm looking at the halftime show, but uh, first of all, let me let me talk about. And I I know that this may bore some 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 of you, you know, talking about football, but I think in in a lot of ways it's kind of important because it is a it is a mass accumulator of attention and uh, consciousness. It drives a huge signal. Okay, and there are times where sports are actually meta events. That they they actually exist as uh, mega rituals, and, and oftentimes in very dark ways. And um, I was over at Visible's blog um, last night, and I uh, I'm gonna have Visible on the show on Friday, although he won't be live. I'll be talking to him on Tuesday night, so tomorrow night, and I'll have the uh, interview on Friday. So um, I was over at his blog. And he had actually watched the Super Bowl, and he made some interesting points. He didn't really go completely in the direction that I, that I that I'm going to attempt to go in today, but one of the things that he talked about 
was what was hap- what happened during the Baltimore New England game, which happened two weeks ago, and uh, the Baltimore Ravens pretty much outplayed the New England Patriots for most of that game. This is the game that they play. If they beat each other, if they one of them wins, they go to the Super Bowl. Some very strange stuff happened at the end of that game. Uh, the first thing that happened was there was this play with Lee Evans. He caught a touchdown pass in the end zone, and then it was stripped away. And normally the league will look at a play like that under two minutes. It's a scoring play, and they will review the play. The league didn't review the play, which I thought was unusual, to say the least. So that was one thing that the Ravens did not have in their favor. So now it's um, fourth down. It was actually um, third down. It wasn't even fourth down. It was third down, though the clock on the stadium said it was fourth down. Now remember, they're playing in New England. So New England, the, the team is, the home team is sending the visiting team wrong information okay now it comes time for billy cundiff to come out and kick a field goal to tie the game and put it into overtime well cundiff has a routine that he does for every single down so here it was it was actually third down but cundiff was acting like it was fourth down with his routine and he was screwed up And they even had a timeout to spend, but they didn't spend the time. There was something really odd and slightly supernatural about the end of that game and kind of missing the field goal, thus ensuring the New England Patriots a spot in the Super Bowl. It was very odd. And and, uh, Visible talks about this to some extent, but not – no, not not to to the extent that I'm doing doing my best to go on. So we have the Patriots getting into the uh, the Super Bowl with very suspicious elements. And again, they're they're not just suspicious; they're surreal. They're odd, extremely odd. So the coach of the Ravens, John Harbaugh. All right, so let's uh, let's cut to San Francisco. Later, right after that game, it's the 49ers versus the Giants, and the coach of the San Francisco 49ers is Jim Harbaugh, John Harbaugh's brother. Very hard-fought game. Uh, the Niners essentially matching the Giants blow for blow. And there was a play in that game where – the 49ers had stripped the ball away from Ahmad Bradshaw. And I've seen plays like this happen. Uh, and i would not seen the call for this play like this ever happen. Essentially, what, what happened was the running back got the ball. He was being tackled. Uh, one of the 49ers uh, plucked the ball from him before he hit the ground. Now, people said that the whistle blew. And no, the whistle the whistle signals the end of the play, and the whistle did not blow until the ball had left his hand. So we have a person who had not touched the ground. He was getting the ball taken from him, and then the whistle blew. The call then became uh, it was um, progress, forward progress. A huge turning point in the game. Huge. The 49ers get the ball there. They drive a little bit, they kick a field goal, they win the game. End of story. We've got 49ers in the Super Bowl, but it doesn't happen. They don't get the call. There are also things that happened during the 49er game which were inexplicable, like uh, defenders running into each other, smashing into each other, you know, from the 49er side, where they had a clear interception, a clear uh tide-turning series of moments. And then you had this punt returner slash kickoff returner, Kyle Williams, number 12, the hanged man, by the way. Talk about a scapegoat. 
he had one ball hit him, just graze him. Now, what happened on that play was, this is on a, on a punt return. What happened on that play was the Giants uh, punt return, the guy on the Giants punt team ran out of bounds and came back in. And apparently he can't, he can't touch the ball after he does that. Somebody else has to be able to touch it first. So there was actually something that nullified his participation on that play, and the refs did not call that. And Kyle Williams' mind state in this game was just bizarre. Now, he had had a cu- concussion a few weeks ago, been cleared to play, but his mind state was still bizarre nonetheless. And it felt to me, again, that there is – I, I, you know, I'm good at reading – Events. I'm, I'm I'm good at this. I've done this for a living for a long time. I can pick up energy, and I, I had the strangest time, like penetrating into the energy of this 49er Giant game. It was it was almost like there was a a cloud around it or something. It was like a field. It was a dark field around this game that I couldn't really couldn't really crack. There were times I felt like the Niners could win. I felt like the, the Giants. Could, I did not. It did not feel confident in the game and the energy and the and even the weather at candlestick was dark and foreboding and and uh there was something i'm going to say this now there was something very supernatural about both games about the baltimore ravens game with john harbaugh and the san francisco 49ers game with jim harbaugh there was something supernatural about both of those championship games and and quite frankly very dark that allowed both the giants uh, and the patriots to them be in the Super Bowl. Now, what happened yesterday, a very strange game. I mean, there were things that were that happened during the game that they normally wouldn't call. Like, for instance, there was a, a safety that was called on on uh, Tom Brady. Uh, it was the, I believe, the first offensive play of the game for the Patriots where he was in the end zone. He was about to get tackled, and he threw the ball downfield. It was, it was deep. It was a long pattern. Nobody was there, so theoretically it was intentional grounding, uh, but because he was in the end zone, it became a safety and, and kind of a major point in the game, but again, very rarely called. Now, the Patriots wound up getting uh, three pass interference calls on their end of the field and very, uh, again, dubious calls. And, and so, you know, what does it all mean? You know, it's like, I, you know, I think if you've ever seen the movie um, Devil's Advocate with Al Pacino, there's this one scene where somebody, I think it's Al Pacino, he goes to Delroy Lindo, who plays uh, an Obeah. He plays a like, a like a voodoo priest. And it's a case that's coming up, and he has... Delroy Lindo, the Zudu priest, put a curse on the um, the plaintiff, and it's the lawyer actually. And the lawyer, the curse says he's got he he sticks nails like like in this in the throat of a chicken or something like that, you know. So when the guy goes to defend his case or prosecute the the case, he can't talk, and he's he's screwed. So. He loses the case. I'm going to say, I'm going to go out on a limb, and I'm going to say that there are, at times, supernatural forces invoked in sporting events. I'm just going to say it flat out. And I believe something like that was going on in these two games in order to get the Giants and the Patriots into the Super Bowl um, for various reasons. And at that point, I think that, you know, what we have, we have the, the Giants uh, versus this sort of emblematic kind of archetypal version of America, the Patriots, right? The Patriots associated with the American Revolution. And even though they're Bob Kraft's team, and even though his wife, Myra Kraft, is beloved and all that stuff, and, you know, there's, there's, a, you know, there's a, lot of, a lot of history there. Um, they represent theoretically America, Patriots. And what happened was is that they lost to the Giants. And who, you know, who are the Giants? What are the Giants? The Giants are the oligarchy. The Giants are Goldman Sachs. You know, I mean, this theoretically, this is 
They're not owned by Goldman Sachs. They're owned by the Mara family. But this is this is what the Giants represent. The Giants represent something defeating, quote unquote, the the Patriots, the Patriot dream. Uh, but there is also another thing that happened at the Super Bowl, and that was Madonna's halftime show. And I was I was very curious about this and trying to figure out you know where it was going and what what it was all about. And um, it started off with Madonna emerging uh, from what looked like an Orphic egg being pulled by Roman soldiers and reenacting Egypt. And then when Madonna uh, emerges from the egg, she's Isis. So all of a, so we were immediately in the midst of an Isis ritual. And then she, uh, kicks into vogue, which of course is a pay-in to uh, dancing at gay clubs, a style of dancing at gay clubs. And that's the first thing she starts saying. Mo- Moby thought it was great. Oh, how wonderful. Madonna, you know, beaming homoeroticism into millions of, of houses across America. It's like, Moby, haven't you ever seen American Idol? Have you ever, have you ever heard of Adam Lambert? Nothing new, Okay. Like it's not anything novel, please. So she she does the Vogue piece, and there's if you the the stage was pretty amazing in terms of what they were able to do with the graphics. If you look at the towards the end of the Vogue piece, she has um, an image of herself beamed onto the front part of the of this really um, multimedia drenched stage. They could, they could move images. They could shift images. It's super. What they're able to do now with with this stuff is super sophisticated. My God. Uh, so one of the images for her was uh, a single eye. So now we're starting to see some, you know, kind of a classic, quote, unquote, Illuminati symbolism, you know, begin to make itself known through this through this ritual. And then she moved, and then she went into um, music, and did kind of a thing. She took off the the headpiece, the the crown of Isis, and then she got into this b boy dance. You know, it was fairly innocuous. But there was one one point where she almost fell. I don't know if you caught that, but it was at the top of the stairs or the top of this what was the temple of Isis, and she and she almost fell. She came down, she did her thing, and then she started uh, to bring in the first of three guests. And the, the first guests were LMAFO and or L- LMAO or LMAFO, whoever those guys are. Um, and, you know, it was okay. There was a very awkward moment where one of the guys from that group was holding her leg and was like, what the fuck are they doing? And it's like, you know, is this supposed to be, you know, part of the dance? Or are they screwing up? Or I it looked very awkward. So then they morphed into uh, from that. They got into um, her her new song, which was odd. It was about love, Madonna, love, Madonna. It was just it was it was it was incredibly narcissistic on some level, and it was it was she was totally ripping off Tony Basil, Mickey with the cheerleader chant. And then she's joined again um, with uh, with Nicki Minaj on one side and MIA on the other. And they're rapping and, you know, sporting their, you know, Egyptian ritual costumery. And at one point, MIA says, I don't give a shit and flips off the audience. Uh, and it was really funny because CBS tried to like flash or, or was it NBC tried to flash a graphic really quickly, but they couldn't do it. And then there's a, a, a drum team that comes on and sort of a being Fleetwood Mac and Tusk. You see, there's nothing really new under the sun. You know, Madonna is kind of like ripping off Tony Basil, they're ripping off Fleetwood Mac. And then, and then, and then there's this, you know, uh, there's another Madonna tune. I forget the name of it. It's a very short transition piece. CeeLo plays the drum major, and then it, and then things get very interesting at that point. 
at about 9.49 on the video. You can find it on, on YouTube. At 9.49 on the video, the, she shifts into uh, like a prayer, which is all about sex. It's not. It has nothing to do with, with you know, God or or religion. Even though they make it sound like that, you know, with with the chorus and everything, and people, you know, you know, are are you know testifying and singing like it's like it's gospel music, and it's it's really not. It's about it's about sex. And at one point, she's even talking about in the song, she's referring to oral sex at some point. Um, it's good. So it's a, it's a, you know, it's one of those tricky songs, like a virgin, right? You know, what is like a virgin all about? Well, if you've ever seen the first few minutes of Reservoir Dogs, you understand what that song is about. It's about a woman having sex with somebody who's really well endowed for the first time. That's what that song is about. So anyway, Madonna is, 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 is she's the queen of, of the double entendre, even though I don't think she writes many of her songs at all. Anyway, at about 9.49 in the video, something really interesting happens. The image that they show on the main stage it becomes very sophisticated. It starts off as a black sun. And the black sun morphs into a giant eye. And you have to you have to watch it, but it's it's really really sophisticated. It morphs into a giant eye, and then it then it sort of you know melts into you know kind of a black sun emitting you know golden rays of light. And then Madonna is singing about seeing seeing you or something like that. I see you, I hear you, and. Below, because there's two areas where, where there, well, the whole thing can be staged for a variety of images, but the second image that appears appears below where the first one, where the black sun emerges and then becomes an eye. The second image at 11, really at 11 minutes into the video, you can go find this at 11 minutes into the video, there is an eye. Clearly, an eye, an all-seeing eye, at the bottom of the stage. <coughs> so here we are again, you know, evoking uh, the the eye of Horus, and and uh, basically saying, you know, you're all being watched. You know, you're all being watched. You know, you think you think you're watching us. Well, guess what? You're probably being. You, we're watching you. I mean, that's 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 the image. That's that's the message that was coming through at that point in time. And if, then, of course, everything ends in world peace. Oh boy, world peace, wonderful. You know, and so they, you know, the the most the, for me, the most intriguing parts of that of that halftime show, twelve minutes, are the beginning, the invocation of ISIS, and then at the end. Uh, like your prayer the, with the eye of Horus, showing up not once but twice, invocation of the black sun. And there you go. There's your halftime show. Welcome to the supernatural theater of the Super Bowl, the supernatural bowl. The commercials were um, flat. I mean, they haven't had good commercials since, you know, the crazy FU money of the dot-com era, as far as I'm concerned. Remember, remember back in, like, uh, 90, 97, 98, 99, where, you know, everybody had this IPO money. And like, what, what should we do with it? Hey, let's get a Super Bowl commercial. We don't really have a product. It doesn't matter. Let's do the commercial, and then we'll get the product. But they don't have that kind of crazy money. So you get, you've get you got these, you know, huge companies now paying $3.5 million for their spot. And um, the commercials were incredibly flat. You know, boring, really boring. There were two. Well, first of all, there are a couple things that that, that popped up. Uh, one was a, the, an advertisement for a new movie called Battleship. I don't know if you've seen this, but uh, I thought of this in terms of context of like Neptune and Pisces and Chiron and Pisces and war at sea, 
right? I mean, and what do we got going on right now over in the Persian Gulf? You know, we have half of the U.S. fleet over there in the Strait of Hormuz hanging out, waiting for action. And what are we seeing yesterday as part of the commercial buffet, the commercial smorgasbord, a film called Battleship starring Liam Neeson, who, by the way, seems like he's in a movie a week now. He's in the Nick Cage phase of his career where he'll do anything at any time. I guess this is what happens when you tragically lose a wife the way that he did. Uh, So Battleship is about fighting aliens at sea. I don't know if you, it's so, so I'm watching this thing. In fact, I even watch it with my, with my kid. I mean, he's always watching it too. So there, apparently there are these objects, these sphere like objects that fall from the sky. They're, they're like Bakugan, which are these little things that my kid plays with. And out of these sort of sphere like, you know, balls of destruction emerge these, these aliens. And they look kind of like a cross between the alien from Alien, uh, Ridley Scott, and uh, Transformers. That's what they look like. And so what happens is, is they wind up fighting people at sea with this battleship. And to me, it was clearly, number one, predictive programming, right? War at sea. Two, you've got the, uh, you have the disclosure Project Bluebeam meme, and three, it gets, it's, it's pure kind of Neptune, Chiron, and Pisces. It's water, it's film, it's deception, it's illusion, it's all at sea. Uh, it, was, it was, you know, kind of a shocking commercial on some level. It's like, oh, wow, what is that? Great. So they've got that. Then, of course, they have a new, another new movie coming out called G.I. Joe. Starring Bruce Willis and The Rock. So now we have the Army or the military version of this. Oh, great. So now we've got the Army, we've got the Navy. If you notice recently, uh, we just had a film about a squadron of uh, black American airplane fighters in World War II getting us pumped up. You know, it's, it's, I'm going to have to go back in time to kind of figure this out, but I'm assuming that in in times of war, or just before times of war, there's probably a spate of military films that get released. That's that's my take. To get people massaged, to massage their psyche about the prospect of war. So we had this Red Tail, this movie about the Red Tail, I don't know, what were they, Red Tail Rangers, or whatever they are, with with, uh, Terrence, uh, uh, what's his name, the actor, so, so you've got we've got that we've got GI Joe we've got we've got Battleship, all all happening right now precursors, predictive, in our face swirling in our psyche, films about war. Three of them. There's another film about war that's coming out, and it has to do with. I'm having a hard time kind of deciphering it, and I'm going to have to kind of spend some more time with it. But essentially, it's about Navy SEALs, and it is there are real Navy SEALs in the film, and apparently the, the whole idea is, is that they are here in the U.S. fighting terrorists in the U.S. And that's this is a film that's coming out, I think, in the next week or two. And I, and, and they sh- they actually showed that commercial towards the end of the Super Bowl. So we had three commercials that were ramp-ups towards war being shown during during the Super Bowl. Three of them. Another interesting commercial, again, I'm just playing with astrology here, uh, was a, a Neptune in Pisces commercial about a kid who's in a swimming pool who can't pee because he, he, he's in the swimming pool he has to pee he realizes he can't go there and then he gets up he gets out of the pool he runs to the bathroom bathroom's blocked he has all these you know places where you know he's supposed to be able to go pee and he can't so he runs back in the pool 
And he goes, pee anyway. And and it was it had something to do with insurance. It was bizarre. But again, I couldn't help but think of here we are, Neptune and Pisces, and we're, we you know this whole, you know, all this water imagery is coming through with the commercials. The Super Bowl itself was flat. It had very little resonance. I mean, I guess maybe if you were a, a Patriot fan, you're on the edge of your seat, or a Giant fan, you're on the edge of your seat. But I, I got to tell you, one of the most boring Super Bowls ever, ever. It was flat. It was two-dimensional. There was no resonance. Zero zilch, zip, nada. And, and quite frankly, I'm glad. I think it's good. I think it's good. Because what that means is that these mega events that we place so much meaning on at times, that the ability to attach our attention and our signal to, that's waning. Think of it like like emotional Velcro, right? That we have these things that we have invested in, and whether it's the World Series or whether it's the Super Bowl, or whether it's a presidential primary, that that there's something missing in our connection with these events now. I can feel it. I can feel it inside myself that 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 the the ability to connect with these things is becoming less and less and less. Which means our attention can go into different places. So if we are, are if we're less bound by the social conditioning and the ritual of these events, well, then what's left over for us? What do we do with our attention after that? Where do we take it? It's like, wow, this is really not that interesting anymore. You know, at some point, I'm sure at some point in the not so distant future, we're going to say, why did we even pay attention to this stuff to begin with in the first place? I mean, that's where I think things are going. And the reason I think that is, is because we're we're beginning to move into a a more multi-dimensional relationship with reality and these uh static stayed rituals are not coherent with the amount of depth in multi-dimensional interconnectivity that we can experience at some point, they're just going to become boring and lack any kind of value or meaning. And when that happens, I think things are going to get very interesting because the world as we know it is going to change. Our relationship with these markers, these symbolic events in our lives are going to change. And then it's like, well, where do we have meaning? Where where do we have some friction, you know? Where do we connect? Where do we spark? And that's where we're going to put our attention. It won't be these these these, these gross carnival rituals. It, it's it's going to change. I'm telling you, it's going to change. And eventually you're going to see stuff like uh, the ratings for American Idol, they're going to go down. You're going to see ratings for some of these other shows that are going to go down and that people are going to get concerned. When I say people, I'm talking about the people that make the shows and the advertisers. As much as they're going to want to shove this in our faces, people are naturally and organically going to start to turn away from some of this stuff. I can feel it. And I believe that this Super Bowl is a precursor of that happening. I was talking with my friend Dell yesterday, and he, he said, and this is a guy who, you know, used to be a sportscaster, and we talk about sports all the time. And he said that yesterday's Super Bowl, for him, and we didn't, I, I gave him zero of my spiel. He just launched right into it. He said that yesterday's Super Bowl, for him, was the most, he said, he said that it represented everything about where America is today, which is disconnected, totally disconnected. And I, I couldn't agree more. And he, and you know, what he tried to do and what we did for probably about the next 45 minutes to an hour was to sort out why that disconnection 
was occurring. And we both had our own reasons for it. Mine primarily is energetic. And <clears throat> I believe that we are shedding the yoke of these supernatural mega rituals and uh, in, in all their various little manifestations. So what's, what's going to happen is that we're going to look around and say, well, if we don't like this, if this doesn't hold our interest anymore, then what are we going to do? How are we going to connect? Where, where are we going to share our, our time and our thoughts and our visions? And it's going to, that's, that's going to be interesting. We're going to be withdrawing our attention from the, the collective theater of events. That's my sense. That's my sense. I, I'm, I'm predicting right here and now that you're going to see more and more people get rid of their satellite TV, get rid of their cable TV. I know a lot of the a lot of you out there who listen to this don't even have TV. You're ahead of the curve anyway. <clears throat> but I'm I'm telling you, people are going to ditch. People are going to start ditching their multi their their mass media. And this is where things I think are going to get tricky for the you know the quote unquote the powers that be. If they see that people are unplugging, that means one of their main conduits of control. Uh, will be will be evaporating. I'm having deja vu, by the way. Will be go, will be going away. So, what we're seeing here is the shifting, and I felt it yesterday in a big way. The shifting of our attention away from events that used to grab our attention and hold our attention and act as demarcations of meaning throughout the calendrical year, and the Super Bowl being one of them. Now, we've got another one coming up on the horizon, and I want to do the math for the, the days between um, the Super Bowl and the Olympics, because what we have here is the Super Bowl is at Aquarius, and the Olympics start at Leo and the Sun King. And I want to be able to see how many days exist between the Super Bowl and the opening ceremonies of the Olympics, which which are the mega ritual of the year. It's also the the Jubilee, the Queen's Jubilee. And um, I believe that the Super Bowl and the Olympics are kind of astrological bookends for one another with Aquarius and Leo. I'll get into that maybe more later on the site and more later in another show. But that's the next one we're staring down. That and the, uh, and the Olympics. We also have the ongoing carnival show of the Republican primary and all the uh, caucuses and the the Mitt Romney machine. Oh boy, America! I feel for you. I really do. I totally do. Ron Paul has been absolutely, utterly marginalized. I mean, they the media has taken a full court press on just putting Ron Paul into a hazmat, <laughs> into a media hazmat unit. I mean, you don't even get guys like Bill Maher or uh, uh, what's his name? John Stewart, you know, jumping through rings of fire to declare their, their, their man love for Ron Paul. That's all kind of gone away now. So, you know, and, and what we have is we've got the, the, the Mitt and Newt show, the Mitt and Newt sideshow. And I think what's going to happen again is throughout the the summer, and it's clearly it looks like Mitt Romney will be the uh, the Republicans' nomination for president. I don't I don't know if I don't know if he can beat Obama. I really thought that Obama would not have a second run here, and I'm I'm still going to stick to that, even though I'm feeling less sure about that. I think a Hillary jumping ship when she did was very interesting and could set up something else uh, for for the Democrats, potentially. And I think you also have to keep your eye on Jeb Bush. And I've written about Jeb Bush in my uh, in my newsletter. And I'm not a fan of Jeb Bush. I'm not I'm not advocating Jeb Bush. But I've looked at his chart and he has some some really major aspects that are coming up for him in terms of being elected huge aspects and he's also a water dragon so keep your eye on Jeb Bush but again I think what's going to happen 
is that people are going to see these debates. They're going to see, they're they're going to pull back and realize that there that there is that there is nothing there. That there is nothing there. That it is a hollow ritual. They're gonna they're gonna they're gonna knock on that thing and they're gonna hear nothing but space, the ringing void of space, in these in these events. And what what will happen? They'll look, they'll say, well, what, if this doesn't have meaning, then what does have meaning? I think 2012 is a huge time for a lot of people in this country, and even in other countries, but really in this country, to do soul searching. This is this 2012 is a collective soul search to figure out who we are and why we're here, and what is no longer making sense to any of us, because those markers are just not going to work anymore. Trust me on this. They they don't have the multi-dimensional gravitas to grab our attention any longer. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is um, I'm going to play just a little bit of music. I'll check into the chat room, see how people are doing, get your takes on the Super Bowl. If you if you saw, <coughs> excuse me, if you saw the Super Bowl yesterday, if you saw Madonna, uh, if you saw the halftime show, if you saw any of the commercials, which were two-dimensional, and you want to call in, give me a shout. We can we can do that. Um, so I'm going to play a little bit of music here just very quickly. Not a huge thing, but I'll check into the chat room. Let me just do uh, let's do that's nice fun. Let's do testing one, two, three. This is uh, Michael Lee Hill. It's uh, three minutes of scorching guitar. It allows me to get into the chat room, say hi, and check in. By the time I come back, we'll have about 10 minutes left in the show. And if you want to chime in on the Super Bowl or anything else, Feel free to do so. If not, then I'll I'll talk a little bit about China and then I'll wrap things up. Testing one, two, three, Michael Lee Hill.
right, that was testing one, two, three, Michael Hill. And we're back, 10.48. Uh, wrapping up with the Super Bowl and moving on. I just put a new post on my website up. I stayed up till about 3.30 in the morning on Sunday and crank this thing out. Sometimes you just got to do it. You know, you just got to do it. And I did a post on the return of Neptune in Pisces. And what I found was really interesting is some of my research was that um, right at the outset of Neptune in Pisces is when Marx and Engels released the Communist Manifesto. That kind of blew me away, to be honest with you. They released it on the 24th of February. So we're really looking at 18 days from the uh, anniversary of the release of the Communist Manifesto. And I thought I thought about it in terms of a, a Neptune and Pisces document, and it really, in a lot of ways, uh, held up and, and is a, a kind of a secular uh, manifesto of oneness. I mean, the, the wiping away the division of the classes and and all that stuff. And uh, anyway, I got into this on my website, and, and and one of the things that I talked about on the website, and I just talk about it briefly is the is one of the great fears of this country is that uh, Obama is going to turn the United States into a, a in, into a socialist country well p- people it's already happened it it, be, it started happening with first of all FDR obviously that's where we get our first major inoculation of socialism uh but it really began it really took off well, there there are, are two main phases. That then, uh, Lincoln, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Lyndon Johnson and the Great Society, and then lastly Bill Clinton and what they did in the Clinton administration with the Chinese, and they literally uh, allowed the Chinese more ingress into Amer- the American economy than ever before. And, and it hasn't stopped, and in fact, it's only gotten bigger. Uh, there are a number of what they call economic uh, free trade zones that are being set up here in this country for the Chinese, one of which is uh, up in Idaho. And essentially what it is, it's a, these are going to be uh, industrial centers, industrial towns that are going to be completely Chinese. They will not have to have any kind of <clears throat> Excuse me. They don't have to have any kind of um, adherence to American tax code. They won't have to hire American workers. They will bring their own workers over from China to work in these in these industrial zones. And the only thing that they'll be able to that America will be able to profit off of to some extent are, are any kind of resources that are sold to these economic zones. That's one version of what's happening. Another version of what's happening is happening not far from my house where they're putting up the new span of the uh, of the Bay Bridge. And uh, here we have an opportunity for a quote unquote American company employing American workers to get in and profit off of tax dollars, the economy, all kinds of good stuff, right? Well, what happens, or what happened here uh, in the in the in the span that they're building and will be ready, I believe, in 2012, is that they awarded the contract to a Chinese company, Shanghai Zhenhua Heavy Industries. This is the company that is building the bridge. It is not an American company. It's a huge hit on the economy. Because these guys are working for half the American wage, and and they're they're sending the money back to China. I mean, so if people are 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 afraid that Obama is going to turn us into a socialist country, it's here. We're here. It's already here. I'm going to read this. So I mean, this is uh, by a uh, this is from last year, by the way. Seven eleven eleven. Elaine Kurtenbach, Associated Press. China's biggest heavy machinery maker wrapped up work on the new tougher East Span in the San Francisco Bay Bridge on Monday. 
hoping success with the $6.3 billion project will help it clinch more overseas contracts. California's Department of Transportation shows Shanghai Zenhua Heavy Industries to fabricate the steel girders and tower meant to improve the earthquake resistance of the bridge linking San Francisco and Oakland after the 1989 Loma Prieta quake collapsed part of the bridge. Zenhua, which until recently focused mainly on manufacturing cranes, is hoping the project will seal its reputation as a top-notch builder able to meet the most stringent safety and quality specifications. They had American companies that they could have used, they could have bid on, but instead they chose to have a Chinese company. Apparently they're also involved in a bridge in Alaska. I'm not sure if it's the same company, but it is another instance where they can they can be used. It says the decision to have to save some $400 million by outsourcing the fabrication of the main section of the bridge to Zenhua reflected global realities, especially of the aging American steel industry. So Steve Hamminger, Executive Director of San Francisco Metropolitan Transportation Commission, the Chinese company has gargantuan facilities, some 35,000 workers and the ability to make and deliver the huge crane needed to lift the new sections and this is just absolute utter bullshit. Sorry. I sound like a I sound like a redneck, don't I? This is just absolute utter bullshit. You damn Chinese coming here taking our jobs. What's well, America coming to? Uh in the shipside ceremony Monday, the American contractors building the new span of the bridge. American Bridge Company and joint venture partner Fleur Enterprises repeatedly praised the 2,000 Chinese who worked on the project for their diligence and professionalism. So the problem here, boys and girls, is that our infrastructure has not been supported. The aging infrastructure is aging because we haven't been able to update it. Nobody's using it. They're using these other people because the money has gone there to them. I remember, believe it or not, I still remember when I was a kid that there was a notion that Americans could do it better and faster and smarter than anybody else. I'm not sure that's the case anymore. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not that provincial. But I do think that Americans can be very, very inventive and creative. It's in the chart. It's in the chart of the country. Sorry, it's in there. Got a nice little dose of Gemini, which which uh, adds a lot of uh, a, lo- a lot of adaptability and creativity and inventiveness to the American chart. I think I think Americans can still be creative, um, but unfortunately, the infrastructure for manufacturing has not been supported, which is why, unfortunately, the Chinese got this job, and. And from what I understand, Americans could have, if given the chance, American companies could have retrofitted very quickly and got in on the job and done what they needed to do to build it. Anyway, I wrote about that. That's part of that's part of this whole Neptune and Pisces thing that we've got going on. It's the division of boundaries, and and part of it on the shadow side is globalism. And we're, we certainly saw that here in um, in the Bay Area with this bridge. And we're seeing it also in Alaska. And I think there's another project. So, you know, welcome. Welcome to the, uh, the New World Order. Uh, okay, it is 1057, and I'm out of here. I want to thank you for putting up with me for being two minutes late. You know, time is really tricky. I mean, I, I, I got up today. Time is just just zooming by me at light speed. So I want to, uh, I want to thank you for listening in and being patient Wednesday, um, navigating the astrological matrix and Friday, I'll, Friday should be an interesting show. I'll have two taped interviews, one with, uh, visible and the other with a controversial maverick film director, Abel Ferrara, who directed the film, uh, the bad Lieutenant. And King of New York, starring Christopher Walken, very violent film. He also he also directed a version of The Body Snatchers. 
So um, I'm interviewing Abel Ferrara on Thursday. I'll have the interview on the show on, on Friday. So be sure to listen in on the uh, Friday forecast. All right, use your head to discern what's real and your heart's stiff and what's possible. I'm Robert Phoenix, and you got mashed up. I'll see you on Friday. Adios. We are living in a computer programmed reality, and the only clue we have to it is when some variable is changed and some alteration in our reality occurs. We would have the overwhelming impression that we were reliving the present deja vu, perhaps in precisely the same way, hearing the same words, saying the same words. I submit that these impressions are valid and significant, and I will even say this, such an impression is a clue that at some past time point, a variable was changed, reprogrammed as it were, and that because of this, an alternative world branched off.